Welcome back. Somebody gave me this dead Zonos Zap Generation 1. For your non audio file types, that's a subwoofer, okay? And I was told when <laughs> the thing was handed to me, it's a bit on the heavy side, about 5 to 10 kilograms. Uh, it turned out I misheard. It's 5 plus 10 kilograms. So it uh, weights in at about 15 kilograms, which was uh, quite a hassle for me. Anyway, we will first try to find out what's wrong with that thing and then maybe in a second video try to repair it. Enjoy! Before we do anything else, we measure the input resistance at the mains AC leads and this turns out to be about 700 kilo ohms, which is quite a lot. If you consider that according to the type label at the bottom, yeah, these are the rubber feet, that thing can draw up to 2 amps out of mains AC. And if you can't read anything here, there's nothing wrong with you or my camera. It's the highly designed, yeah, in the USA label at the back, which is made out of some semi-transparent plastic. And then on the <laughs> back of the plastic, yeah, it mirrored is uh, all the information printed in a light gray, so you can't rub it off accidentally. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, uh, as you can see, 2 amps, I already mentioned that. 100 to 240 volts AC, and yeah, 700 kilo ohms is far too much for the input of such a probably switch mode power supply. And it has all the <laughs> usual labels and is assembled in China. Besides the main AC power inlet here and a little Ethernet port, there's nothing else here at the bottom. And these are also the only cabled interfaces of that thing. When I plugged that thing in, I saw a nice little blue arc. So something is still going on in there. Anyway, uh, the complaint about it is if you, and <laughs> this is the only hardware user interface, the power button, if you press the power button, nothing happens. This LED is supposed to come on, but yeah, no luck. According to my isolation transformer, <clears throat> yeah, I know it's loud as hell, but uh, it is what it is. Uh, if you want to see how I built it, uh, cards here, links in the description. The thing is still drawing 60 milliamps aboutish, which uh, makes me believe that there's still a standby power unit inside there working, but uh, yeah. Nothing happens here. Anyway, um, let's get that thing open, huh? If we are to believe the sources on the internet, <laughs> then the screws to open that thing cannot be found at the bottom, for example, hidden under the rubber feet, but instead they are hidden under these thin black uh, metallic plastic aluminum, we will see. Uh, inserts here. And uh, just to verify it, you don't believe everything you hear on the internet or even see. There is something here. And, ooh, that was a uh, loudspeaker, but there's also something here. Something below here. <laughs> loudspeaker and something here. And I guess it will be the same on the other side. So four screws, no screws here at the top at the bottom. The internet <laughs> advises you to put a screwdriver here is a, yeah, a little slot between the chassis and that black glued in thingy here to get it out, uh, basically to rip it loose. Um, I will use a chisel because a chisel has a wider edge than a screwdriver and hopefully 
This will minimize the destruction. Now let me work. That operation <laughs> deformed, that uh, I don't know how you want to call it, uh, <clears throat> anti-repair measurement uh, considerably, but nothing that could be bent back in shape again. It's made of aluminum, by the way. And the other face uh, towards <laughs> the desk is resting on some soft foam, so I won't scratch it, hopefully. The eight screws are supposedly locked tight in, so we'll see if... No, they are coming easy. And they are locked tight in, but uh, obviously that doesn't do much. And now that whole side is supposed to be <laughs> to come off. However, I think we will need some more resistance. Uh, I've seen on YouTube, <laughs> they are going in here with a screwdriver, which leaves uh, really nasty marks. But if you come from here, it's actually quite easy. <laughs> And we are confronted with a particle board plate and even more screws. Yeah. These are still <laughs> Loctite threaded screws, no self-tapping <clears throat> BS. So yeah, that's good, but... Why not attach that thing instead of gluing it on with some Velcro or some uh, four small magnets? Yeah, Sonos. Okay, self-tapping screw, the first one. Uh, probably holding on this plastic frame here. And now we can, or not, lift that thing out. Yeah, it's coming. Woo -hoo -hoo -hoo. So here are the innards. That's the digital board with Bluetooth and that cable goes uh, to the Everlet connector in the bottom. And the uh, mains AC cable is routed somewhere down there and goes here, I'm not touching the pins, uh, into this board, which is probably this side power supply and that side the amplifier stuff for the subwoofers. And then, uh, yeah, this is probably the uh, wireless LAN and Bluetooth. Uh, two antennas connected here and then uh, unshielded uh, flat flex cable going over to the amplifier board. And here's a closer look of that power and amplifier board. I'm still not touching because there might be charged up caps here on the primary side. Uh, you can see here uh, there is not really an isolation slot, but there's a very wide area where the, uh, at least on that side, maybe that's a single sided board. Mm, I don't believe it, but uh, maybe. Uh, there is a very wide gap between the, what I suppose, ground copper planes of the high voltage side and the low voltage side. And I guess from here on, uh, that's really uh, just a guess. Uh, this might be still part of the power supply, but uh, that here, 
that's probably your class D amplifier stuff from the back. Now let me probe a little bit around here if some caps are maybe still charged and then we take the board out. But before we do that, let's have a look at two atrocities here. Uh, here we have these two solder balls on, that's the low voltage side of the power supply. And we have two more of these solder balls here in the audio section. <laughs> and I've spotted the first casualties here on the high voltage side of the power supply. R72 and R42 have given their lives in resisting the current. That's the chip controlling, and yeah, it's upside down, the high voltage side. And it's an F, mm, the company logo, TGYAA6300H. Uh, production date MYD, whatever that means, that code. Yeah, we will have to look up uh, <coughs> some reference circuit for that chip uh, to get further in our analysis at a later point. For now, let's get that board here out and have a look at the other side if there's some more obvious damage. Uh, you can't see it, of course, on camera. And I did uh, <coughs> discharge all the caps here on the primary side. But everything inside here is necessarily very magnetic. I mean, look at these big permanent magnets there. So I really have to take care not to let any <coughs> screws fly into the direction of the speaker magnets. And now for the big reveal. Okay, there is definitely some resistance here from all the connectors. Am I still in picture? Uh, yeah, I guess. And it's all upside down. Oh, that's really nasty. Okay, that was our mains AC. And now this side is almost lifting up. Yeah, it's lifting up quite easy. And now the other side. Oh my God, okay. Two of the screws I just removed were actually threaded screws, not the self-tapping type. And these were not holding down the board. Instead, they <laughs> attached a big aluminum heatsink on the back of the board, which came loose now. And these two screws were located in these two holes and I will try to reattach them, which might prove a little bit Tricky, but doable. Okay, heatsink is attached again. Now let's see what's holding that board back on this side. Well, it's the 0.1 inch pitch cable here going to the uh, digital board and oh this is not nice the speaker cables are actually manually soldered in and they are <clears throat> these are where the uh, big solder blobs so you cannot really get that board out without desoldering the speaker cables yeah Hold your horses with the soldering. Um, <clears throat> I accidentally removed one already. Uh, <laughs> the speakers are just connected with quick connects here. Uh, automotive products. Mm, yeah, I just need to wiggle them free. That one gives me some trouble. Just a sec. Okay, here we go. That's the first time I think I ever saw quick connects in uh, in some kind of hi-fi equipment. <laughs> but okay, 
otherwise, uh, the cables are even, uh, let me change the view here real quick. There are clamps here. Well, not really clamps, but uh, yeah, something to hold that longer cable here in place, so not too bad. Now I'm trying to get the quick connects on the other side. The cable here with the flat flex on the digital board is a little bit in the way. We can remove that safely. And this comes out, <clears throat> the white one, very easy. Yeah, on one side it's black and red and on this side it's white and green. I don't think you can, it's giving me trouble again, uh, you can uh, mix <laughs> the left and the right speaker up uh, when putting that thing together. Here we go. And we have the board free. So here's an overview of the board from the other side. Here is one speaker connection. That's the connection to the digital board, another speaker connection. And here is our mains AC in. And this is obviously the high voltage part. Then here comes a big rectifier diode here. And these are also low voltage capacitors, relatively low voltage. And then we have another switch mode power supply here, probably for the logic supply. And that's the audio amplifier. Here's the high voltage side. Yeah, I turned the board off the power supply, mains AC in here. And then we have a little 5 amp and yeah, it's upside down, but I <coughs> turned the picture, uh, rotated the picture, okay. 5 amp fuse, uh, 250 volts, a proper Y or X filtering capacitor, and that's a common mode choke. And we have a MOF here for uh, any input transients that might find their way inside here. Another Y or X type filter capacitor, and that's, I think, another even bigger common mode choke. A full bridge rectifier, uh, three filter capacitors. We have a look at the values in a second. Uh, another Y or X type uh, filter capacitor here. And that's a MOSFET or some other switching element. And then uh, we go into the transformer. And there's a lot of supporting stuff here on the other side too, as you saw. A lot of filtering capacitors or yeah, they are probably filtering something. I don't know what and uh, that capacitor already belongs to the secondary side of our power supply. And here over that large isolation gap, that's a uh, optocoupler giving back feedback to our switch mode controller on the high voltage side. Here's our <coughs> switching element, Q6, MOSFET or whatever, and some su more supporting SMD stuff here. And is that rust on the screw? Seems to be some, not rust, but some goo. That's not a good sign. And I uh, have to zoom down further, but uh, R36 and this D3, so some uh, dual diode, I guess, they also don't look too hot. So the case of that diode is definitely cracked or double diode. Uh, while the resistor looks still okay, also the capacitor here, but uh, yeah, that thing is dead. The MOSFET or switching element, whatever they are using, Q6 uh, uh, is at least not cracked, at least I can't see uh, it being cracked, but there's definitely some goo on here, what we already saw here on the top of the screw. I have no idea what that is, but it's it's sticky. Um, yeah, maybe we can measure that thing if that's still alive or not. The caps on the primary side are Nichicons. Oh, they spared no expense, at least there. 400 volt, 100 microfarads. So I guess 300 microfarads in total. 
The output filtering caps on the secondary side are uh, Jackcon, don't know that brand name, 1800 microfarads, 63 volts. So I guess we are running quite a high voltage here for the audio amplifier. There's still more supporting stuff here on the secondary low voltage side, but it looks at least okay. An unpopulated U6. Uh -huh. That's the second switch mode stuff and I don't see any... That looks funny here. Let's zoom down in a second. But I don't see any more casualties. And uh, by the way, the rectifying for that switch mode uh, thing happens here. There is a D2 and then another filter capacitor, just 100 microfarad, 16 volts. So I suppose that's the 12 volts for the digital board. Looks good, but for that thing here. And let me shine some light here. No, no, all looks good, but for that little thingy. Yeah, it depends on the light, but it seems to have some heat damage. Oh, we will see. Uh, we don't know what went wrong with the uh, <laughs> primary side, but the rest here looks just fine. To be honest, I'm not quite sure about that thing here. It looks slightly discolorated, but uh, yeah. Yeah, probably okay. Hmm. And that's the whole of the audio amplifier section. And there they are using again Jack Con 200 microfarad 63 volts. So the chip controlling that switch mode power supply is a Fairchild a Fan 6300H. And I'm pretty sure about that because these are exactly the markings we saw on the chip. And here's the one and only application diagram in the whole datasheet. Um, we already know that this here, that's the uh, current sense shunt, that that is burnt out. This was the two SMD resistors on the other side of the board. Yeah, my first two casualties I spotted. It's questionable uh, if that MOSFET <laughs> survived, uh, if there's enough current going through here to blow up these resistors. So yeah, and we had that other cracked diode and these were only the visible faults. I have no idea where that diode uh, resides. Uh, which diode it is. It's not that diode. Uh, there's a whole array of larger freewheeling diodes on the back, probably all in parallel or something, or maybe in series uh, for higher um, voltage rating. Uh, maybe we have a look into it, but uh, yeah, <clears throat> the fault is clear. So let's have a quick whiz around here and just make sure, yeah, you see the uh, ohmmeter somewhere. Um, uh, not the best shot of the uh, multimeter, but that thing here is, sure, yeah. That thing is isolating and that thing here is isolating too. And as far as I can see here, the signal, the current feedback that was a CS pin is taken between the two shunts here. So uh, yeah, these are, by the way, 33 milliohms. I saw that on a photo of a board where they were not blown. Um, yeah, anyway, um, then this here, connected uh, to the shunt, that would be our source. And the pin here with a very small connection, <laughs> that's probably our gate and that makes that thing that's going directly here to the pin of the transformer, the drain. Anyway, so uh, that is blown. So our 
completely. Yeah. So our uh, source is completely isolated. And uh, just to be sure, let me change to millivolts here or to volts. That should be enough just for a second and measure the voltage between the gate and the source. Not that we have something residual here. There are no residual voltages on that MOSFET. That's good. So back to ohms. And then the resistance from between source and gate is in this direction. That's the correct direction. Uh, oh, <clears throat> about 4 kilo ohms. There is something going on, some capacitor charging up. And in the other direction, that should be uh, in the direction of the internal body diode. Also 4.4 kilo ohms rising. Let me just go to the diode test here and see if we can still find a body diode here. That's interesting. We have a body diode conducting from drain to source <laughs> with uh, 1.8 volts. And uh, I guess we also have a body diode conducting in this direction. That's the direction it should conduct with 0.5 volts. So the body diode uh, is still there, but uh, your conductive or non-conductive channel is uh, quite broken down. And uh, yeah, we can also do a diode test between the gate here. <laughs> And the source, uh, yeah, there is nothing. Here goes nothing. This should all be isolating. I'm not saying, uh, showing a diode breakdown uh, conducting voltage. Uh, but let's go to ohm. That's just to be sure. So from the gate to the source. <laughs> is that true? Gate? Source? 36 ohms and the other way around, gate source. And remember, the source is isolated. That resistor here is dead. <laughs> okay, um, that of course would have had consequences for the rest of uh, the circuitry. So a drain source, okay, still 4.2K, the other way around. 4.4K, let's say 4K. So we know uh, <clears throat> the MOSFET is gone too. It's always a little bit uh, tricky to measure a part inside the circuit, but yeah, that's that. And that uh, means I think this here is also dead uh, because uh, on our DC rail here, uh, we have 325 volts. Yeah, we are in 230 volt AC land here in Germany. And uh, that connection here from the drain to the gate was about 4.5 kilo ohms. And these were burned through. So we have a direct uh, connection here into the gate driver pin. Uh, yeah, uh, the <clears throat> actual resistance here, uh, DC resistance of that coil is negligible, uh, a ohm or a few. So depending on the size of the resistor here, and I guess this should be a very small resistor, we would have here injected into the gate or still injecting to the gate every time we turn that thing on or connect it to AC uh, 70 milliamps. 70 milliamps. And if you look at the, at the internals of the chip, we see here at the <laughs> gate driving output pin, we have a clamping diode, a zener, uh, that should clamp the voltage here to 18 volts, but that's for the protection of the MOSFET gate. Okay, not for the protection of the chip. So we pumped in here 70 milliamps into the MOSFET driver. Uh, yeah, reverse. 
<clears throat> that thing expects uh, to drive uh, basically an isolated gate of a certain capacity. Uh, okay, uh, I think, yeah, that's also dead. Or at least seriously damaged. I'm not saying it would be completely impossible to repair the primary side of that power supply. Uh, replacing these resistors, as I mentioned, I know they are 33 milliohms. The shunt resistors wouldn't be a problem. Uh, replacing the MOSFET here wouldn't be a problem, I guess, if we can still read the type here. But remember that little diode down there that has been blown up? I have no idea what type that is. I cannot read it. I haven't found any high-res photos uh, showing that diode. And uh, by the way, of course, you don't get a circuit diagram of that thing. So uh, yeah, replacing that would be a guessing game. Maybe it's a shot key. Uh, I don't know. Uh, yeah, and uh, accessing it for some SMD soldering, hot air soldering, uh, oh, I don't know. Uh, you would have to remove at least, at least uh, the heatsink here of the MOSFET. Maybe the transformer and yeah. And after that, you would have to check probably each and every component around here and uh, yeah, exchange that chip here um, yeah, as a precautionary measurement because it makes absolutely no, <laughs> uh, well, it makes sense. You would learn something, but it would be extremely frustrating if you start exchanging all the <clears throat> blown up components and then uh, yeah, feed mains AC in here and they blow up again because something here in the controlling circuit uh, for that switch mode power supply is still awry or has been blown. So checking all these diodes and uh, while they are in the circuit, uh, you would have to really reverse engineer the whole thing and I don't think it's uh, worth it. Uh, I mean, uh, that would be a uh, a hobby project in itself, uh, taking days of work, I guess. But there are people out there who are better than me and uh, will probably tell me in the comments it's absolutely no problem. And even if you could repair that, the question would remain if the <laughs> low voltage side uh, wasn't damaged by that high energy event here. Um, but maybe there's a way uh, to find out if it's still working. Okay, after probing around a bit on the low voltage side, I came to the conclusion that this uh, test point 115 is plus and test point 119 is ground. And my proof is that this ground pin basically has a short connection. Oops a short connection to the minus terminals of the big filter caps and uh, the TP115 has a short connection to the positive terminals of the filter caps and uh, in case you shouldn't believe me uh, yeah there's the negative side these two pins, a little bit out of focus, sorry, and these are, of course, the positive terminals. So I soldered some cable to these test points, which was a pain in the neck because, uh, of course, this is all lead-free solder here. Then I have uh, 30 volts from uh, that power supply uh, in series with uh, currently 18 volts from that power supply for a total of 48 volts. And if I now <coughs> connect that, we will see if something... Okay, that was just the capacitors charging up. And oh, oh, you see? There's something happening there. Uh, let me zoom down. It's blinking. I have no idea what that means, but something is alive. Uh, we're drawing basically 60 milliamps or so. 
but in the uh, different uh, forums on the internet. Uh, sorry, I'm still zoomed in. Oh no, it's red. Now it went into standby. So that is uh, zooming in again. That's not my Zonos, okay? Uh, but if I go here, click again. Maybe it needs 25 wall, 52 walls. So let's go up with the power here. That's what they wrote in different forums. Uh, close enough. Okay, um, let me get my iPhone and uh, I will install the Sonos app. Uh, I managed. <laughs> Uh, to download the Sonos app, yeah, the first one, the S1, didn't work with that uh, speaker here. So I downloaded the latest one and then I needed a software update for the speaker and I needed to create an account and blah blah. Yeah, I, I don't like that, uh, you know, uh, app locked in stuff. But anyway, I was able to connect to that thing. So at least uh, the whole digital board back here seems to be working. And if that survived, it's uh, very likely that also the audio amplifier section survived our high energy event here. By the way, I'm running that currently on 48 volts, not 52 volts and it seems to be still working. Don't know about the audio amplifier though. Uh, it will probably um, not be able to churn out the full power, but uh, anyway, the 48 volt is important because my repair approach would be to <coughs> dispopulate uh, the whole uh, power supply section here and then mount on that PCB, I uh, have to search if I find something small enough, an open frame 80, 48 volt power supply here on the back. There is some space, not much space, but maybe it's possible. I have to uh, yeah, uh, make a look-see <laughs> uh, for suitable power open frame power supplies. And then just feed 48 volts DC in here. And uh, yeah, I mean, that power supply was always on anyway. I haven't found any, any, uh, oh, let's say it the other way around. I haven't found a second optocoupler beside the one for the voltage feedback to switch here the high voltage side in some kind of power safe mode or sleep mode. So this was always on. So it's probably okay to put here an always on open frame switch power supply in. Yeah, let me have a look. And indeed you could just fit in here a CUY VOF-180C 48 volt power supply. So. 180 watts and drawing uh, from mains AC about 200 watts. And that's what, according uh, to the labels at the back, uh, this contraption is a drawing. I have no other means to <clears throat> determine how much power do you really need, but uh, I think 180 watts should be enough. And well, the height is just 26 millimeters. So let's turn the board around again and make some measurements. And indeed, most of the stuff below here is at least uh, 31 millimeters high. So you could really, yeah, that's uh, the heatsink and these capacitors. These parts here are even higher. So you could fit that in here and uh, well, with five millimeters to spare for a standoff from the original board or even some isolation sheet uh, in between. So yeah, uh, that would indeed be an option. 
that's it for today. That uh, QE PSU would uh, cost about 65 euros. So yeah, might be worth it. I mean, there are no guarantees that the analog stage uh, is still working, but uh, it's highly probable. Yeah, confidence is high. Um, but you also get, at least here in Europe, in Germany, a repair service, not from Sonos themselves, of course, but a third-party uh, repair service for these uh, sub, uh, Sonos subs for, yeah, 200 euros fix. So I will ask now my friend uh, what <laughs> what it's going to be. Uh, should I put everything together again and let him send that in for repair? Or should I try the uh, cheapo uh, <clears throat> questionable solution of uh, screwing in here, depopulating the board and mounting another switch power supply? Yeah, we'll see. Till then... Bye.